listeners, welcome to the second episode of Season 2 of The Blue Radio. In this episode, I will be broadcasting my interview with Angie. Angie's mother lived in a religious cult and was in a polygamous relationship in Angie's early childhood. The negative impact that living in the religious cult had on uh, Angie's mother further on extended to Angie herself. Also, Angie survived sexual abuse and grooming throughout her childhood. She had a creative way of recovery and healing that we'll, we will be hearing about. Before we dive in, I would like to say that this episode contains mentions of sexual abuse and emotional abuse, so if these topics trigger you, please listen with a trusted friend or professional. very interesting family dynamic because uh my mom she left a polygamous relationship I don't know if you know what that is but she was uh, like in kind of a religious cult um (laughs) in Utah so like yeah 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 it's Mormons and uh it's it was like a commune called the rock in Utah so it's pretty famous and um I didn't really experience like the trauma involving that environment too much like my siblings did because we moved to California when I was like five um but just the aftermath of her PTSD from those relationships uh kind of led to her not being able to care for me and my other siblings a little bit on that I think our listeners would really like to know uh about this type of life the like uh the polygamous relationships and how they cause trauma yeah it's it's I can't speak too much on the actual like religious aspect because I didn't I wasn't too much of a part of it but the aftermath was pretty intense she became um obsessive and like with that cave dweller lifestyle and like made it her life's mission to like write about it and talk about it all the time and like so at a very young age I was like her little therapist and um was always dealing with her trauma and it was put on me and she would just latch on to any man who seemed like a savior um, for her so when I was five we had moved to these apartments in Carmichael and uh, she met this man named John and he moved in within like a week and uh yeah, he was my, my abuser and they're still together to this day, which is really upsetting. Um, but yeah, she just would cling on to anyone who she felt would like save our family or save her and, uh, disregard her children. So, uh, you said that this man was your abuser. Are you comfortable explaining that how uh, this abuse was? Yeah, of course. Um, I've talked about it pretty extensively, so I'm not, I'm an open book (laughs) at this point, but um, like how detailed do you want? Because it was sexual abuse and like in all meaning of that word, it started off just with grooming, me thinking I was his girlfriend, um, me thinking that like I was very special and that he was like my mom's boyfriend and my boyfriend and he would like give me candy and stuff I wasn't allowed to have so that was like the grooming portion and then it became more severe um when my mom would just always leave me alone with him which was all the time um so I was just always at home alone all of my siblings were like seven to eight years older than me at this point so they were high school or or middle school and like just away from the house and um yeah that's the the abuse it like it transitioned from grooming to touching and then eventually I think I lost my virginity to him at like seven I'm really sorry to hear that that just sounds horrible and and on his part inhumane Mm -hmm. Um, so how long did this go on? From ages uh, five slash six to like 11 or 12. 
And then I kind of just put up mental barriers, began to forget everything. Um, when I was around 12, he did something that triggered me. He like touched my butt or something. And like, it really, really triggered me because I started to remember stuff. And I ran to my brother's house who lived next door. And I told him um, that I was really uncomfortable at home and that I just felt weird and I didn't know why. And I was telling his wife and she had gone through uh, childhood sexual abuse. So she could kind of understand where I was coming from. And she confronted my mom about it. And my mom kind of turned it on all of us and made us kind of gaslit us and made us believe that we were being crazy. And this is something that could never happen. And I was uh, reprimanded by her too for even saying anything. Oh, wow. That's, that's, I've heard a lot of abusers uh, use this, like gaslighting and saying that you remember things wrong. Uh, your video. But so uh, when you were growing yeah. up, did you notice that this way of life you had was abnormal or uh, did you think that everyone's life is pretty much the same? Yeah, I had no idea. <laughs> I thought my life was so normal up until two years ago. And then I was like, wow, I need to do some reevaluating. <laughs> So uh, what made you find out that your life was not normal? What was the, um, like, what was the pivotal point? Oh, sorry, my wife is cutting. Okay. Um, so I had, so I considered myself an atheist from about um, five to 18. And then when I was 18, I had a really intense spiritual awakening. I realized I wasn't an atheist. And at the same time, uh, I had made my family watch the Michael Jackson documentary, which is about him abusing kids. And it was very detailed. Like we didn't expect it to be so detailed. So it was very triggering for the whole family. And we didn't know why. And uh, just sitting with that trigger, and I'm just a very analytical person and like, thinking about it a lot and wondering why we had such an intense reaction like a normal family wouldn't cry when watching a documentary about something like that and like scream at each other so that kind of made me start to realize things and then um I was with my sister and I don't know why this it was just like just my intuition and her intuition but I was saying, I feel like there's something I have never told you that I've always wanted to tell you and I don't know what it is. And then she just got really cold and blank in the face and was like, uh, why have I always felt that John has mistreated you? And then I just started crying and I was like, cause he did. And then that's just the realization. Like it came all at once. Like I always knew in the back of my head but actually having someone ask me again as an adult and having more recognition of what sexual abuse is um, definitely like just made me realize that my childhood wasn't normal. Right, wow, thank you for that explanation. So uh, when you were growing up, like when you were in school or in the age to just start socializing and things like that, uh, how do you think that your mother's behavior and the uh, mistreatment from the man uh, she was with impacted you, like impacted how you interacted with other people, your schoolwork, or any other thing that comes into your mind? Mm -hmm. Well, I was always uh, like in love with my teachers and I didn't really get much respect or support at home. Like no one ever told me they were proud of me or that they loved me uh, like parent wise. So I would cling on to my teachers and I was the teacher's pet, which helped my grades. I did really well in school. Um, but meanwhile, I was also very sensitive to other people and terrified of other people. I would get picked on a lot just because, you know, kids can tell when that one kid is vulnerable. And um, but I it kind of shifted once I reached middle school, I became more sociable and popular but then my grades started to diminish and I was diagnosed with like depression and anxiety by the time I reached 12 <laughs> which was wild to have that diagnosis at such a young age and then once I had that diagnosis it just kind of shifted my 
my uh, schoolwork and um, I didn't want to get out of bed anymore. I couldn't get out of bed. I had to be homeschooled once I reached high school. Um, so I did really well up until about 12. Right, I understand that. So uh, on the path to becoming an adult, how did this um, experience you had in childhood, both on your mother's side and uh, on her partner's, how did that affect you as an adult? As an adult, it's made uh, sexual relationships more difficult. It's a lot harder for me to trust someone um, and to articulate what I like and don't like. And I get triggered by certain things, like even just someone tickling me really triggers me because that's what my abuser used to groom me, you know, at a young age. So I will literally lash out if someone tickles me and it's not something I can control, which sucks. And uh, romantically, I had a lot of codependency issues, which I've somewhat healed, still like an everyday battle. But um, yeah, I, it used to affect me a lot worse. I used to attract like abusive relationships because that's all I had ever known. So I would just settle for the worst and luckily that's not what I do anymore but that really impacted me throughout high school and um up until maybe like a year ago right uh, and another question I have for you is that how is your relationship now with your uh the people who abused you your your mother and uh her partner unfortunately not very good uh I've tried to reach out to my mom. She kicked me out when I came forward with the story. And now I live with my brother and I've tried to be there for her. I tried to get therapy with her and she likes to trigger me on purpose, which is bizarre. Like, oh, she would tell me to come over and then he would be there and it would just send me in a spiral and I would have to leave. So just having a different lens as an adult and realizing that she's a bit more vindictive and manipulative than I remembered as a kid has made me have to distance myself. And uh, John, I haven't talked to him like at all since I came out about this. And uh, yeah. So did your mother explain why she was so enraged by the fact that you came out with this story after all where you were her child and she was outspoken herself against trauma and abuse? in the cult. So what, mm -hmm. uh, what was so bad about the fact that you came out with this story for her? It's the fact that she didn't want to leave the relationship. She still doesn't want to leave the relationship. I remember we, in I initially came out about it and um, initially she was very supportive. I'd say maybe for a week. And we even went to weave together, which is like a sexual assault, um, hotline and they also have like a actual business in Sacramento where I am so we went there together and they told us like you both have been abused you both have been groomed and things started to click for her and she didn't even know that he was also abusive towards her and then it just terrified her because she didn't want to believe that she had put me in that environment and she still doesn't believe it like she she believed it for a good week and then um, was able to trick herself, which is really interesting, like psychologically. So she was pretty much in denial from that. So would you, would you say that uh, from the time that you were in the midst of this abuse to now, would you say that you have had a healing journey? Yeah, for sure. Especially during COVID because I was forced to be alone for so long. So I was forced to either use it to my advantage or let it you know, destroy me and send me into a depressive spiral. So I use this time to really like pick up all the broken pieces and um, create positive experiences from what I went through. Also, I wanted to show this book too, if you have any chance at all or any time, but- um, Yeah, please do. Okay, cool. So I wrote this book when I was a kid and it has some really dark undertones now that I'm an adult. <laughs> but like, if you're a kid, it's a cute story. Um, so now I'm trying to work and make this into a real book. And at the end, it says like to be continued and I'm going to have it be continued like from the adult perspective and hopefully like uh, hope 
help other other adults who have gone through similar situations and also it could be a really good tool like for adults to open up these conversations with their kids even though it's not a fun one to have um but this is just a little expert expert I don't know how to talk right now <laughs> so it's a story about Holly who's me and uh she becomes a witch and she's just kind of escaping her life so I use this to like self-soothe I guess um uh, this is page 14 and like it's all has artwork on it too like I'm pretty surprised I did a good job for a seven-year-old but I said I got mad so mad I yelled and said I don't want to go trick-or-treating with you I don't think she seemed to care she kept on laughing and laughing nothing so I went home I told my mom everything but she didn't believe me either so I started crying well look on the bright side I said on Halloween you don't have to put on makeup but that was no help I thought and thought but I couldn't think of just what to do the worst thing is that nobody could help me I was so bummed out it was now dark and something really weird happened I picked up my broom and sat on it once I did that I flew I was flying I guess being a witch isn't that bad but I wondered what had caused this. I went outside with my broom and gave myself flying lessons. I was pretty good after a while. I flew to my friend Allie's house to give her proof that I'm a witch. She said, she saw me and said, okay, I believe you. And then it says to be continued. And it like says to all relatives. And <laughs> the end. I was really trying to express a point with this. <laughs> so I think that you were trying to have someone believe you. I think it just, you said the sentence over and over. Is that what you were trying to do? Yeah, definitely. And uh, yeah, especially my mom, like I pointed her out and how she didn't believe me, which is so sad. <laughs> so uh, if you would want to tell the survivors out there, if you want to give them some advice on uh, how to start on their healing journey, what would you say? Well, I would say the biggest thing for me is learning not to identify with your trauma, like it doesn't define you. Um, recognize the ways that it's affected you because those things are very real and um, but don't feel helpless don't feel like you're incapable of, of you know starting your healing journey it doesn't matter what your diagnosis is and uh, yeah don't identify with your diagnosis either like obviously they're there for a reason and it can be a tool but that being said um, at a young age, I was told I have, you know, anxiety and depression, and I let that define me for a really long time. And then I realized like, oh, yeah, I do struggle with depressive thoughts and anxious thoughts, but that's not me. Like, I'm still, I can be a happy person. <laughs> so I think that's the number one thing that people should know. Right. Uh, that's actually a great point. Uh, when I was talking to experts, they also were telling me that uh, having a history of childhood abuse or having a diagnosis doesn't mean that your life is defined up to the end. There's always hope. There's always place for recovery. And yeah. yeah. So if you were to go back and this time talk to your childhood self, who is in that uh, very scary situation, what would you tell her? Uh, I, I actually do that sometimes. It's called inner child healing. And I have like a bunch of pictures from when I was from that that abuse uh like the peak abuse time so I've learned to like get comfortable with myself from that time period which I never identified with that child I like would see pictures of myself and be like that's I, I don't recognize you like that I don't know but now um I will just look at myself and I imagine that I'm there with my young self and like just giving her a hug and like letting her know like I know you don't feel loved right now, but you're super loved and you'll find that out as you get older. That's beautiful. Thank uh, you. So is there anything else you would like to add uh, to this whole interview? Is there anything you want to say that I have not asked about? Um, I would say another thing that's really helped me at least as fundraising like transmuting this negative experience into a positive one for other people that can be benefited um and also just speaking out as much as possible i i'm a nanny so i have conversations with the parents about like stranger danger because i can give them some insight that schools and other places don't give and i also have a conversation with the kids if they let me and like let them know that 
something like this has happened to me and it's okay. And uh, they are allowed to, you know, I have a whole conversation with them pretty much. And that's been really healing as well. Just knowing that I could potentially be helping another victim because like pedophilia is such a seedy underbelly of our society. Wow, that's amazing. So you're using your own experience and the uh, trauma you've been through to make the world a better place for other uh, childhood abuse survivors, especially people who have gone through grooming and child sexual abuse like you have. Oh, that's amazing. I'm actually very happy to be talking to someone like you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and uh, with that, I will say that thank you for sharing your story. I know that uh, it's not the easiest thing to do, and it requires a lot of courage and power to share things that were this hurtful. So if uh, you don't have anything to add, I have nothing further to ask. We have now reached the end of episode two. Thank you for listening and stay tuned for another episode.